hello and welcome to Wellness Wednesday with 3W. This is Beth Chase, your host for today's first broadcast in June. Dr. Susan Rutherford, the President and Medical Director of 3W, is here with me. Welcome back, Sue. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, thank you, Beth. It's interesting that this is the beginning of June because June 7th, which is the first Sunday in June, is National Cancer Survivor Day. So we thought it'd be appropriate to touch on the topic of cancer and how can you avoid or be a survivor rather than uh, not be a survivor. Excellent. So I know that your concern is the opportunities that, you know, cancer, if it goes undetected in a in an untimely manner, like is, is you waited too long to discover yes. that there's a problem. Yes. So tell me about that. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion because of COVID. A lot of what I think is very essential health care has been skipped. And I've heard of all sorts of delayed surgeries, maybe even delayed chemotherapy, tr- cancer, actual cancer treatments. But also some cancers, it makes a big difference if you find it early to survival. One big example is breast cancer. What we can do is touch on a few of the reproductive health system cancers. Okay, so, great. Good. Can I talk about breast Absolutely. cancer first? Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about breast cancer. So I want to start with a story. It was very soon after we opened, a 30-year-old woman came to us who didn't have health insurance and had been convinced that day by her friend to come in. She called, and we were able to fit her in the same day right away. She had a history of having noticed a lump in her breast starting four weeks before, and she almost didn't come, but her friend literally twisted her arm and and made her call and she did come in like within a couple hours and I took one look and started to feel and it was like "Uh uh-oh this is not good and she's only 30 so I was pretty sure because it was very hard it was lumpy it was oh about a fifth the size of her breast and, you know, irregular shape, mm. and it was pulling on the skin. Wow. So it causing an indentation, so irregularity of the skin so that the breast didn't look, didn't hang normally. So I was pretty sure this was cancer, and I thought, we got to get her in. She fortunately had been on Medicaid, oh, six months before, but was no longer on it. But she didn't have a job, so I was pretty sure she'd qualify. So my main urgency was getting her in for an appointment the case management and getting the insurance, that could be straightened out. So I called one of the very prominent cancer service organizations in this area that provides cancer care. You know, big deal, lots of allies and all of that. They said they couldn't see her for three weeks. Mm. I was shocked. So I got on the phone and I made some more phone calls and I found a very good center that could see her within a couple of days to do a mammogram. And so we set that up, and I was able to communicate that, well, we're not her primary provider. We can't follow her. We don't have the capabilities. We're just as kind of a screening uh, clinic. But uh, certainly within was four or five days, she had the biopsy and confirmation that this was an aggressive cancer in a 30-year-old. So I was so glad we got her in. But the message is she'd been waiting four weeks. Now, many times... Four weeks doesn't make a lot of difference, but there are some aggressive cancers where it does make a difference. So if you feel something in your breast, you probably ought to get it checked. Most of the time when people feel something, say it's tender, usually breast cancers aren't tender. Usually they don't hurt, but they can feel really, really hard, maybe like a little rock or pebble or something, or if they're irregular or if they're making that pulling on the skin so the surface doesn't look smooth, if it's starting to feel stuck, which is caused by some surrounding scar tissue that's starting to form. Those are things where you need to get checked. And you need to, when you're feeling your own breasts, you need to feel all the way up in the armpit because the tail of the breast goes up there and there are lymph nodes up there that drain the breast. So sometimes the cancer might grow in the lymph nodes bigger than you might find it in the breast. So those are important things to look for periodically. We've done away with the check your breast every month system because that really didn't pay off in terms of reducing the breast cancer death rate in the studies that have been done. But certainly women should be aware of what their breasts normally feel like and when they find something that doesn't make sense, 
they need to get checked. Mm -hmm. so. Or don't they, I mean, I know in my just regular annual exams, mm -hmm. Will Women exam, yeah. that there's a very thorough breast exam that yes. goes along with that. Yes, well, actually, I really like to do that because I use it as a teaching opportunity. We have this little model that's made out of sort of rubbery stuff, and we can have women feel that and see what they might feel if there was a problem. But, uh, you know, there's actually been formal professional recommendations that you don't need to do a breast exam with those well woman checks. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Why something that's simple, that doesn't cost more money to have somebody actually feel the tissues, why would you abandon that? So I'm not sure I understand why the professional organizations are saying that. So I offer it to women. I don't insist on it. But essentially, everybody says, yes, would you check my breasts? And I'm happy to and, and reassure them and explain to them what they're feeling that feels like it does in their breasts. Because breasts don't all feel the same from one person to the next. Mm -hmm. And say, for you, this feels normal. And uh, if you feel something different, this is what you might be looking for. Mm -hmm. So, Sue, is, um, is breast cancer, do you think it's on the rise or is it on a decrease? Or well, is it I don't know of any particular acute trend right now, but certainly okay. compared to 30 or 40 years ago, it's on its higher rate. There are some concerns that one of the reasons might be our, over, our tendency to be overweight, mm. the obesity, because that does occur more often in women that are heavy. Mm -hmm. That's a, a kind of a risk factor. It's a pretty soft risk factor. So that might be why. It's not a huge difference. It's gone, I think, from like 1 in 11 to 1 in 9 or 10 mm -hmm. as far as the rate. So it's not a huge difference, but it's a little more common than mm -hmm. when our mothers were. Well, you and I speaking at our <laughs> yes, age at our about age. our mothers. Our mothers are like 90 uh, or no longer yes, here. So yes, that's not... exactly. That's so true. But anyway, I'm wondering, though, Dr. Sue, about breastfeeding. I remember... That oh, there's yes. some who feel that breastfeeding helps to decrease it the, does. the risk. It okay. does. It uh -huh. does. And there have been some interesting studies. You know, there's a big debate about breast cancer and abortion. Well, it turns out that some of the data actually came from Seattle, from the major, you know, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, from one of their primary, you know, their preeminent researchers, with, did a lot of data, and young women who had abortions, I'm not, can't remember how many, but one or two at least, that didn't have an ongoing pregnancy. There might have been some change in the way those cells learned to recognize hormonal triggers. And in that data, there was a little higher incidence. So it's not clear that's hotly debated at the national level with between professional organizations. But, you know, you can't say that there isn't a risk, but you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. So are you saying then when it comes to the breast cancer and abortion connection that there's studies and evidence there's on a, both? Yes, for right. Both there, things, it's a mixture. Both sides. It's a mixture. Okay. Yeah. So, there's no evidence that says that abortions decrease your breast cancer risk. Oh, okay. Which is kind of interesting to think that about. That is interesting. It's either like, no, it doesn't increase it or it does increase it. Uh -huh. But there's nothing that says that the risk is lowered. Okay. So if a woman has had one or more abortions, should mm -hmm. she be more intentional about screenings for breast cancer? Well, or I don't, I think everybody should. Just everybody. <laughs> everybody okay, should be intentional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think everybody should. Uh -huh. You know, there are certain situations, particularly family history, because mm -hmm. we know that there are some clear genetic predis predispositions. So uh, especially other close women relatives that have had breast cancer, that's a major red flag. And for some of those situations, they may even need some uh, genetic testing. And you've even heard about celebrities that have gone ahead and had prophylactic bilateral mastectomies, bilateral removal of both breasts, in order to uh, avoid that risk of uh, breast cancer because they carried certain genetic markers. Oh, so is that why sometimes you'll hear about women having uh, their breasts removed? Correct. Because of the yes. DNA yes. issue? Uh -huh. okay. yeah, usually the markers are referred to as BRCA1 or BRCA2. Okay. Those are the ones you most commonly hear about. Okay. Tell me about the role of mammograms in the screening process. Yeah. So, you know, if you have this genetic tendency or really high risk, they could start at a younger age and there's no specific guideline. But I mean, people, some women at very high risk 
might start by 30, you know, having mammograms. In general, for the average risk woman, there's some debate about that. Again, are we spending so much money on mammograms that it's, it's not really paying off? And so this, there's debate about delaying them. But the American Cancer Society says that women between 40 and 45 should have the option of starting. And once they hit 45, it's recommended to have an annual mammogram until they hit maybe uh, mid, mid to latter 50s, in which case they can go to every couple years if things have been normal. Mm-hmm. Well, does there ever come a point in a woman's life where she just does not have to have a mammogram? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think I'm like so. like a pap smear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that any details about that, but certainly okay. I, I know that when people get pretty elderly, going in for a mammogram can be quite a burden. Mm-hmm. And there are risks of other health problems. Maybe they're in nursing homes, things like that. You know, mammograms are probably low on their priority list, taking care of their congestive heart failure and their COPD and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it, everything is weighed in the in the individual circumstances. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's no risk to take a mammogram or to have a mammogram. No, no, there's no risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. You know, <laughs> the radiation dose is extremely uh-huh. small. Mm-hmm. So the radiation, there's no sign that that radiation triggers other cancers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's concern about some cancers triggered by radiation, high dose radiation like thyroid cancer, but not heard anything about breast cancer mm-hmm. with regards to that. Mm-hmm. or other reproductive cancers, such as the pelvic organs. Mm-hmm. Do they ever um, recommend, or does a doctor prescribe, maybe the the physician finds that there is a bump, do they also prescribe an ultrasound in addition? To so, the yeah, so usually, you know, I leave that up to the radiologist. And so when I fill out a requisition form that the patient can use to get the study, by the way, people people can get screening mammograms without a doctor's referral. That's That's provided for. But uh, say I'm writing a requisition, I'll put at the radiologist's discretion. And I draw a picture of what I found, I describe it, and then I let I tell the patient, you know, the radiologist may decide that, you know, you're a better candidate for an ultrasound than a mammogram. You might need an MRI. There's been discussion about using MRIs instead of mammograms for screening. I think it depends on your risk category and what the exact circumstances are. So I kind of leave that up to the imaging professionals, the radiologists. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. I've learned yeah. a few things about mammogram that I should have known, and I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should mention one other thing. You know, one, one symptom can be uh, some discharge from the nipple. Mm-hmm. And I myself one time had a little bit of blood. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Mm-hmm. So I went through the, the uh, mammogram and the, I don't think I had an ultrasound. I had an MRI. I had an MRI guided biopsy. I had a surgical biopsy. It was just a little polyp in one of the ducts and mm-hmm. it was benign. Mm-hmm. And apparently that's most commonly what it is. But I had to go through the whole gamut to, to rule out breast cancer. So that's, but that's, a, but that's a, a real clue. The other thing is discharge from the nipple that's maybe like milk. Sometimes that's related to certain hormonal situations. So, but you don't know. So if you have a discharge from the nipple, that's not expected. You know, if you're not breastfeeding and you have mm-hmm. a discharge, then you might want to consider that. Same thing for men, actually, because men can get breast cancer. So if they have a discharge from the nipple, they need to get checked. Mm. Yeah. That's Boy, I can see really abnormal in men. That'd be so hard for a man, wouldn't it? Yeah. But you they, know, so a man needs to know that, yeah, though. Yeah. You, you can probably even find support groups online for men with... Who are survivors of breast cancer? Wow, that's amazing. Now, one last question about breast mm-hmm. cancer is that I know that sometimes a lump in the breast can actually be a cyst. Yes, right. Yes, okay. very commonly. Very get, a, common. get a blocked milk duct or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and women who are breastfeeding, they often they might get a little bit of infection that causes blockage, and then they get this mass in their breast, and you know, so okay. that's a whole different situation, but there can, there definitely can be benign cysts mm-hmm. in the breast. Okay. So just because a woman spots maybe a small lump, mm-hmm. doesn't, she shouldn't freak out about no. it. She needs no. to go get it checked. Correct. Don't wait. Correct. Don't wait for the COVID-19 to get over. Correct. <laughs> to get in there. It's not, yes. it's not worth the risk when it can be dealt with much in a much yes. more um, concise way. 
Yes. Okay. So what are you suggesting that women have? Um, so and, and, why don't you talk about the, a different organ? Okay. okay. Yes, that's so we right. Talk, we already talked in a previous podcast right. about cervical cancer yes. screening. Okay. Cervical cancer is one of the easiest things to screen for, and the chance of being a con- cancer survivor or avoiding cervical cancer by early treatment of the precursors is tremendous. So definitely the cervical cancer screening. Keep up on that. Um, and that's rest, pap smears. That's pap smears. And what, at what age do they recommend you start having pap smears? 21. 21. 21, yeah. So that we talked about that mm-hmm. pretty in quite a bit of detail. Yes, we did. But the the rest of the uterus. So the the lining of the uterus that during a woman's normal reproductive years thickens and then sheds, we call the menstrual period. The lining is called the endometrium. Metrium refers to the uterus, and endo means inside. And the main clue for cancer of the lining of the uterus, called endometrial cancer is bleeding, irregular bleeding. The biggest risk factor is middle age and, or um, postmenopausal, early postmenopausal. So those are the most common times. Although I've known women pretty young, even as young as 30, who have been found to have endometrial cancer. So irregular bleeding is a problem. In some situations, we can go over the history of their bleeding, their periods, and uh, tie it into maybe lack of regular ovulation, hormonal issues, some of the contraceptive things they're doing, etc. But particularly when you start to get the late 30s or the 40s or the 50s, if you start having any increase in bleeding, increased frequency of bleeding, uh, spotting in between periods, increasing amounts of flow. It can be benign things. There can be a growth inside the lining called a polyp, an endometrial polyp or endocervical polyp. But but also you need to rule out an overgrowth of the lining that at some point is a cancer. And that can be looked for. Initially, there could be an ultrasound to say, hey, is this lining really thick or is it of normal thickness? If it's really thick, that could be a signal that there's a cancer. Or you could actually maybe see some irregularities. But also, the next step is actually getting a sample of that lining. In the year, years past, the first step sometimes was what's called a DNC, which is dilating the cervix and scraping out the inside, and that needs to be done under anesthesia. However, there are some very tiny, narrow, relatively comfortable little tubes that can be slipped up in there with little scraping bits on the end of the tube that can attain a sampling of the lining. If you have endometrial cancer, even if you don't sample the area that's actually cancer, you may find that some other areas in the lining are growing in an abnormal way and that gives you a clue to look closer for the cancer. Every once in a while on a pap smear, if a cancer is growing in the lining of the uterus, some of those cells from the lining of the cancer may fall off, be falling out the cervix And when you rub on the cervix to get the pap smear, they're picked up with that tool and found in the pap smear specimen. And so the pap smear result sometimes will say, hey, there's some abnormal endometrial cells in there. And then you go looking. But there's not really any good screening that's recommended. It's just if you have abnormal bleeding, don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between endometriosis Ah, endometriosis and endometrial cancer. Yes. So you've got the endometrium bit, right? Uh-huh. That endo It's basically the endometrium becomes an osis, you might say, by, by growing abnormally in other locations and spreading. So I'm trying to think of other things that osis applies to. You think of osis, it, it's something that spreads in our body. You know, something that's gotten out okay. of hand. Uh-huh. So the endometrium, that, that type of tissue, if you look at it under the microscope, has certain characteristics. So you can actually see that around the uterus, around the tubes and ovaries, in the pelvis. If somebody looks inside surgically, such as with a laparoscopic lighted tube to look inside, you can see these areas of, of little collections. It's kind of look like um, little burn spots or something. They're dark colored. They actually sometimes will bleed 
Hmm. Um, like the endometrium bleeds with a period. Yes. You can get cysts around the ovaries or in the ovaries that are endometriomas. So endometriosis, it's, it's benign. It's not cancer. But it causes these other problems like pain or infertility. Okay. Um, but it's not cancer. So mm-hmm. endometriosis is not cancer. Endometrial cancer is cancer. Okay. Okay. And, but they both can have the same initial symptoms? Is that what I'm hearing? Endometrial Well, they could. Yeah. Endometriosis, yeah. it's not so often irregular bleeding. Uh-huh. It's more often these okay. other internal okay. symptoms like pain. So if they have those symptoms, if a mm-hmm. woman has those symptoms, she could say, you know what? I need to go find out what this is. Because yes. sometimes we don't want to go get checked out because we're scared of what we're going to find out. Yeah. Right? Because you're scared of what you're going to find out. But people might be scared of what is going to be done to them to find out, Oh, yeah. Too. I can relate yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, are you going to have a biopsy? You're going to have surgery or Uh what? Unfortunately, those are part of the steps. Mm -hmm. Most of the surgeries and and these tests that are done for uh, female reproductive system cancers are pretty pretty straightforward Mm -hmm. and not too uncomfortable and not too risky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you recover pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so what I hear you saying is these symptoms, go find out because it may not be cancerous, but if it is, you want to deal with it. That's right. Yeah, because endometrial cancer, also found early, is very curable. So, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that's good too. Okay. Let's now, one of the a, mm-hmm. none of, speaking of curable or not curable, yeah. one of the cancers is extremely difficult is ovarian cancer. Mm. Some people may remember Gilda Radner, who was on Saturday Night Live, yes. one of the comedians. Remember, yes. sort of very curly dark hair and everything. She died at a young age of ovarian cancer. Mm-hmm. And they actually established a whole research entity down in the Los Angeles area at, um, I think it was at UCLA, to try and uh, research and study early ovarian cancer detection. And they've done all sorts of things like investigating blood markers, because there are some uh, some blood markers that you can find with certain ovarian cancers. Doing ultrasounds to look at the ovaries. Can you find them? when you can't feel them. Ovaries are actually not that easy to feel on physical exam. When you have the regular well woman exam and and your internal organs are felt by by uh, uh, fingers in the vagina and a finger on the on the abdomen trying to feel those pelvic organs, basically we can say well there's no big ovarian mass, but if there's a subtle early change on an ovary, you really un- are unlikely to feel it. So the question is, what about ultrasound? Could you see that? Unfortunately, those studies didn't show a benefit to screening lots and lots of women with ultrasounds. They didn't improve the early ovarian cancer detection. Yeah. So ovarian cancer is a really bad actor because by the time it's found, usually, it's already spread. So it's a it's a really bad bad actor. So what are the symptoms? So it might be, you might notice that your tummy's getting bigger, and that means it's already large, or it's already causing the accumulation of fluid in your belly. We had a young woman that came in for a pap smear, and I felt her belly, and I thought, this uterus is really big. I wonder if she's pregnant, but she has an IUD in. Hmm. Well, let's do a pregnancy test. Well, lo and behold, the pregnancy test was positive. So I thought, oh, easy. She's pregnant, the IUD in. We just pull out the IUD, no problem. So I thought, well, let's just do the ultrasound and check. So then we proceeded immediately to the ultrasound. Same visit. So there was no delay. And and this was a young woman, too, in her early 20s. So we proceeded to drape the ultrasound. It's like, well, the uterus looks normal. There's nothing in the uterus. Uh Uh-oh, what's this other thing? And I found a big mass the size of a cantaloupe. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Now, some of the ovarian tumors I mentioned will produce chemical markers. And this was one that produces the hormone, the same hormone that tests positive for a pregnancy test. Oh. Yeah. And so immediately I was worried about it. So I got on the phone to some of my favorite doctors, some GYN cancer surgeons in Seattle. And they've been so helpful. I really appreciate it. Because I've had several people that they've fit in really quickly. And this was one. And so within a month, she'd had her surgery. Sure enough, it was cancer. Yeah, so that was really, really good to find that early. So Mm -hmm. I'm very much hoping that 
that everything long term that she's one of those cancer mm-hmm. survivors. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I'm very yeah. much hoping we but, can celebrate yeah, with them. But that was an you know that uh-huh. was basically an incidental finding. Uh-huh. But if you notice that something doesn't seem right, get checked. And she you had know? no idea. She had no idea. Fact, and they she had no idea. Well, she test. thought her tummy was getting a little bit bigger. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So now a lot of people think their tummy's getting a little bit bigger. And unfortunately, it's just weight gain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I see a number of those. I see many more people where it's not anything mm-hmm. a problem. It's just benign. And uh, I have to tell them, you know, I've ruled out a big ovarian mass. I've ruled out an enlarged uterus and a pregnancy. So, you know, um, that the least we can rule out those GYN problem things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's not always the best answer either for people. It's like, oh, shucks. Now I've got to yes. really figure out my diet. But, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. But but if you have something, it's better to get checked. Mm-hmm. It's just better to get checked. But that's not something that they would necessarily... Well, they might catch it in a regular exam. Is that oh, true? Yeah. She goes for an annual exam? Yeah, because she was coming uh, in. Yeah, okay. because we, we see a lot of uh-huh. people. Basically, about half of our patients don't have insurance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they have trouble getting access. Mm-hmm. And part of the time, part of the time, it's a big delay because of trying to get insurance or worrying about the bill and that sort of thing. So we provide a really good, accessible, uh, you know. In fact, that's part of our corporate name, Women's Accessible Medical Services. We don't advertise that much, but that's uh-huh. how we started uh-huh. because we realize there are a lot of women that need to get in quickly without barriers, and so we eliminate the cost barrier so that women can get in quickly and we can get started. We can't do everything, but we can. Get the ball rolling quickly. So that's that's why she came in. She didn't have insurance right then, mm-hmm. and or and maybe she did have insurance. I don't remember. But I've had people come with insurance, but they're having trouble getting appointments. So oh. we've seen some of those. Oh, yeah. Timeliness is, is so timeliness. Critical. Yeah, timeliness. Mm. So mm. yes. Well, and especially the... if the insurance is Medicaid, sometimes they have trouble finding a doctor that will see them. Uh huh. For these routine checks. Yes. Yeah. So that's an issue. Yes. Well, the one thing I've appreciated in in watching you, Dr. Sue, is how connected you are. You know, if if there's if there's a need of that patient, no matter what that need is, you're going to make sure that she gets the best follow up care and the best referrals you can possibly have. And because you've been yeah. around so long in yeah. this area and you're highly respected, you know, it's it's amazing yeah. what. What you can do. Well, and there are many doctors I don't know, and we do our best, you know, and I have a team that helps me keep track of things. I ask people to remind me of stuff, for example. <laughs> and even if I don't know somebody, so that one gal with breast cancer, they had no clue who I was, but mm. I was a physician calling. I wasn't just a, a non-clinical staff in the office trying to get an appointment for somebody. I was a physician calling saying, I am certain of this. I need her to be seen soon. Okay. You know, so sometimes, you know, so I'll exert that MD muscle Uh when I need to, to try and get a patient in for something. Does that raise their liability? Because they don't provide... Well, if I'm telling them that, hey, this is urgent, Uh and they drag their feet... You know, well, first of all, I'm going to look elsewhere if I find somebody's dragging their feet. I want the patient seen. I don't care so much about how they feel about about how these, uh, you know, referral people feel about it. I want the patient seen. Mm-hmm. So Got it. that's that's the main thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if people do delay too much, then, yeah, sure, that's a liability. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Well, it's that time again to wrap up this episode, and it has been, again, a very interesting discussion. So, Sue, if you had one message that you wanted every woman to hear today about this topic, what would that be? That you're valuable. You're a worthwhile person, and you shouldn't take difficulties in accessing care or little bumps in the road trying to get the insurance and things like that. If you're really concerned about something, you deserve to be seen. So have confidence, be patient, keep pushing, be the squeaky wheel if you need to, and and do get seen. And this COVID thing, I think people are beginning to recognize that we can't put off other important things in life because of this one virus. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm hearing more about that. Mm -hmm. from the medical community all across the nation. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Sue, for your knowledge and experience in this. It was just been awesome. You can find more information about cancer screenings with uh, some links that are located on our website 
You'll find links on our website from the American College of OBGYN and the American Cancer Society. Now, what you want to do is go to our website by going to 3wmedical.org. That's the number three, the letter W, and the word medical.org. Then you want to click on the Wellness Wednesday tab at the very top menu of the home page. And this page, again, this is where you're going to find those links to these resources for continued information. I just want to also bring up that you can join the 3W community by donating to the cause to assure that every woman in Seattle has access to free medical clinic that does not make money from the choices she makes. So. Thank you again, Sue, for being here. We've got a lot of topics coming up in the next few weeks. So until next time, stay healthy and be well.